Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we are, first of all, I'll uh, put you in context where we are uh, in Belize. So for those of you that don't know, country, uh, it's a, considered a Caribbean country. So it is in Central America, but also has a lot of coast uh, on the Caribbean Sea and has multiple islands uh, in the Caribbean as well. So it's considered a bit of both, which is really interesting. Uh, it's a pretty small country, uh, which is about 180 miles uh, for the Americans by 68 miles. So for those Canadians, it's about, uh, I think it's a, half the size of Nova Scotia. Um, so it's, it's quite small, but it is super diverse, um, which we'll be seeing pretty shortly. So one of the reasons why we had established uh, the station and all of our bird research in Belize is because it is part of the Mesoamerican Biological Corridor. Uh, which also includes uh, the Selva Maya, which is considered to be the second largest stance of um, intact forest after the Amazon in the Americas. So this includes uh, Southern Mexico, Guatemala, and Honduras, uh, Belize as well. Um, and the, it is thought that Mesoamerica contains between seven and 10% of the world's known species. So because of that, that was one of the reasons why we wanted to establish each, um, ourselves there um, and to, to do some long-term monitoring in that area that is so important for biodiversity. Um, and then also Belize is very interested, interesting because it has uh, about 38% of its terrestrial areas are pr protected. So that's about a, a total of 120 uh, different protected areas of different sizes. Um, some of them are, are small private reserves to really large expanses, extenses of, <laughs> sorry, I have one of my, my uh, neighbor's dogs here, or my tenant's dogs are uh, kind of calling. Okay, so one second. Okay, to situate you then for Belize, um, we are, so we are below Mexico in the Yucatan Peninsula, and we are surrounded um, to the west and to the south by Guatemala, and then short, um, yeah, and then Honduras pretty close. And then if we see on the right, um, here is Belize, and it's also in green is all the protected areas that Belize holds. So if we look in this next slide, so we can see that there's a lot of green in the country, which makes it really, really interesting. And then thanks to the Hello. Yes, yeah, so if we, if I could just ask everybody to mute their microphones and even their video too, just to make it uh, uh, go smoother, that'd be great. Thank you. So we can see here uh, the biological corridor and the Selva Maya, just this beautiful green uh, patch in the middle, and Belize, a good section of it, the middle of Belize is um, all protected. So if we so now I'll situate you where we are at trees and at TRBO. So where the yellow star you're seeing here. Um, so this is pretty much in the middle of the country um, and trees. Uh, one of the reasons we really want to establish there because uh, we are surrounded by national reserves. Um, the Manatee, the Cebu and the City River. Um, and so we're right in the middle of that. Um, being a perfect area to do our long-term monitoring work that we've been meaning to do. Okay, so a little bit more about trees. Um, so, one second here. Trees manages, um, is an NGO, a Belize NGO, and it manages the trees field station. Um, so it's a research center with a focus on wildlife um, and conservation. Uh, we do a lot of com community outreach and development uh, with different agroforestry projects, um, also um, 
and capacity building, like we'll be talking a lot about in this presentation, um, capacity building and Belizeans to, uh, to do bird work, to become um, bird vendors, etc. And then we do a lot of sustainable agroforestry community programs um, with our community. So trees is uh, 200 acres of mixed habitat type. Uh, it ranges between 100 to 300 meter elevation. Majority of the area of the trees property is lowland broadleaf forest. But within that we have about, uh, I think it's four acres of organic farm. Um, and also there's a lot of edge habitat and there's, uh, there's about three uh, rivers on the site as well. So all of this is important because it offers a lot of different um, habitats, microhabitats for birds and, and other species. Uh, we also have swimming holes and kilometers of, of nature trail. Um, we see St. Herman's seat, one of the be most beautiful views um, you'll get, I think, in Belize. Uh, it's from uh, the back of trees here. Okay, so at the station, we host up to 60 guests. Uh, we focus on mainly wildlife biology projects, at least for, for this talk and who's ever listening, it's more their interest. Uh, we do other things as well, but uh, focus on internships and workshops. Um, we, we host a lot of Belizean school groups, um, at least in the past before COVID, of course. Um, many would come for a day or for a weekend, uh, work on different projects and look at the um, um, different activities that we were offering, if, uh, offering bird banding or uh, bat work or different things like that, that uh, they've been, uh, they've come to the station to do. We also host uh, postgraduate projects, uh, student projects, and so for any uh, prof or student that may be listening to this presentation, um, that we do have multiple, uh, we have projects going on, but we also have ideas for multiple projects. And as you'll see in this presentation, we, um, we've accumulated quite a bit of data now, uh, in which we're ready to be looking into as well. And we host environmental clubs and uh, at-risk youth camps um, to come to the station and learn about working with animals or working on the farm. Um, well, wildlife, wild animals or working on the farm. So the objectives uh, of trees, uh, which is more related for this talk on our bird stuff, it was that to establish that the Mayamans are an important bird, have an important bird conservation status. Um, a lot of people talk about the Mayamans and, and its importance, et cetera, but there's not that much data on it to support how important it is in terms of biodiversity. So that was one of our main objectives was to establish its importance. So uh, for birds, it's monitoring of avian biodiversity in the Maya Mountains. Uh, established the use of the Maya Mountains by resident migrant birds. So in terms of feeding, roosting, um, breeding sites, how, how are the Maya Mountains used by avian species? Um, data collection on very little known resident species. Um, if anybody has in it, done uh, searches on some of the resident Central American birds, uh, some of them only have two or three publications on them total. Uh, so there's a lot of data um, to be collected and things to be known about them. And then finally, our fourth objective um, is capacity in Belizeans. Um, in terms, particularly in terms of bird work um, and, and banding. So to, to uh, train a group of Belizeans um, that will then uh, become trainers and start uh, leading their own uh, banding programs. Oops, sorry, I cut the bill on the magnolia there. So about TRBO, um, TRBO is the bird research and conservation branch of trees. So it's the Toucan Ridge Bird Observatory. Uh, 
we started bird work uh, in 2012. The first couple of years, 2012, 2013, um, it was only a couple hundred birds a year where we were only mi uh, banding migrants and non residents. Um, and then by 2015, then we got our own bands for resident birds and have been banding resident birds since then. So we focus mainly on uh, resident migrant monitoring in the Maya Mountains and in capacity building as well. So the rest of my talk is gonna be more about TRBO and its, its work. Um, I just had to put trees in there to put everybody in context of, of who, is, um, who is TRBO. So the things that we do is that we're monitoring bird populations. Uh, we're educating local internationals about uh, issues related to bird conservation. We do research on neotropical migrants off uh, their breeding grounds, which I'll talk later using MOSI, et cetera, and research on the biology and conservation of Central American resident bird species. So we teach uh, local internationals in bird monitoring. Uh, so we teach them uh, how to do point counts, bird transects, um, use eBird, et cetera, and then as well, a lot of banding. So it's training for locals and internationals in bird banding is probably uh, what we're best known for. Um, and again, uh, capacity building with Belizean banders and bird workers are really following up with our main objective of uh, Belizeans being able to lead their own um, bird banding program. So our main activities on a day-to-day -day basis are more or less as daily bird censuses, weekly bird transects, we do bird banding, um, small projects of nerd searching, and then we have targeted research projects uh, like a white-collared mannequin uh, legging project and things like that. Um, our banding sessions typically, and that's what's been interesting, interesting since 2016, is that we've been able to maintain um, spring and fall banding sessions. Um, a lot of stations uh, in the tropics will typically do uh, MOSI, <clears throat> part of the MOSI program, but not many are able to do long-term um, spring and fall banding. So that's something that we wish to continue and hope that other stations in Belize would eventually be able to, to do that as well. Um, since 2017, we've been also doing um, MOSI pulses and, and then we open up our nets during various educational sessions so that we do it for education, but at the same time as we're doing it, it's allowing us to get uh, some information at different times of year. So sometimes if we have to open in the summer or things like that, so we've been, it's kind of giving us a little time capsule with things that uh, we may be seeing at those times of year, like brood patches and things like that, that, uh, that uh, typically we'll only see when we catch the bird. Um, and so having these little sessions um, has given us some imp important information as well. So we pretty much are open all, we're banding more or less all year, except uh, maybe the two months in the summertime where it's really hot and there are only a few residents around um, that we don't band. So <clears throat> our migrant work is establishing which species use the site, use the Maya mountains. Um, and so then who is here off the breeding ground and also who is just migrating through. Um, so this can be done by looking at fat content, et cetera, of the birds that we catch is giving us an idea of which um, species or individuals are staying on site. Um, so it's establishing site fatality off the breeding grounds. It's uh, catching um, a bird one year, a migrant one year, and then catching it in other years, uh, which we've been getting a lot of. Um, very interestingly enough, a lot of the recaps that we get are even in the exact same net as uh, from year to year. So really showing uh, good site uh, fidelity. 
Okay, so and then it's also establishing uh, migration routes. So birds that have may, may have been um, banded in North America um, and then caught in Belize or, or vice versa. It allows us to get some longevity records, um, again, by banding and, and recaps and giving us an idea of the winter populations that are staying um, around trees at the base of the Maya mountains. So for resident work, while a lot of it is learning about their mold patterns, this is one of the things that really interests us at the station um, for very little known resident species. Uh, it's giving us an idea for a lot of these birds of breeding season. Um, this will be done by <clears throat> once we catch the bird, we see if there's a brood patch um, or cloacal protuberance in males. I won't go too much in the details of that, uh, but just to say that there are different ways once we have a bird in hand of telling um, if they are <clears throat> reproducing, if it's the breeding season or not. And so for a lot of birds in Belize, some of them may be able to do uh, two, uh, <clears throat> two or three breeding in a year. And so um, a lot of that we're figuring it out, but we're figuring out just by these band, uh, by this banding effort. Again, longevity, so birds that we've banded maybe eight years ago and now we know are still alive. So it gives us an idea of the of, uh, how long some of our resident birds may live that we may not know about. And it gives us an idea of migration cycle. So not necessarily uh, migration, uh, but more movement when there are bird presence and not. There are some resident birds, resident Belizean birds that will be there um, all time of year, while others will be there for um, only certain periods and then seem to be moving around. Um, in country or up the mountains, etc. And then, um, so the species presence and site use as well is something else that we're looking for. Um, is, or this is the site and the Maya mountains used for breeding, for roosting, feeding, um, etc. Okay, everybody good so far? Yeah. Great. Here we go. And then we work with uh, well other programs, uh, citizen science projects and stuff as well to get uh, more data and also, um, yeah. So we have a MODIS antenna at trees, um, working with Bird Studies Canada and Stu McKenzie um, since 2017 that we've been uh, collecting MODIS data as well. Um, and we encourage the bird watchers, the bird banders at trees to use eBird um, and in our community as well. We have different educational programs um, teaching about the, the importance of eBird um, and how fun it could be. And then uh, we also follow uh, the MOSI protocol. We have been since 2016, I believe. Uh, so looking at winter survival of, of migrants of neotropical migrants. Um, so we've been doing between three and five sessions uh, since 2017. And for different projects, we have camera traps out as well. Um, and then these camera traps, while they were made at first mostly to understand the different uh, terrestrial mammals that we had um, at the station, but we've also found a lot of curacao and guan and other interesting species on those cameras. And so we have maintained that. So that in a nutshell um, is everything that, uh, that we do. And now we're gonna go to what we have found in the last, uh, last little while. So where are we at? We're um, getting to our 10th year of bird work. So, the first birds that we're gonna ban after uh, next January are gonna be our 10th year birds. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, we feel that we are meeting our objectives of collecting high quality long-term data. Um, we are starting to be established as a bird banding station and observatory um, by doing all this work 
and training a lot of Belizeans and internationals in, in bird banding. Um, we're starting to get to have a, get a name for ourselves. And we have also, um, with the help of, of others, uh, great partnerships, we've been uh, building a great group of Belizean banders as well. And uh, some that are, are at trainer level now too. So uh, that's been really interesting. So the conclusion from all of our results, and I'll talk about them a little bit more, uh, is that uh, it is clear that the Mayamans are an important uh, migration flyway. Uh, it's an important nesting ground for many resident species, and an important ground for neotropical migrants off the breeding grounds, as well as um, astral migrants um, on their breeding grounds, but going um, to South America on migration. And so how did we um, come to those conclusions? Well, first of all, is that I'll get more into the eBird Day Band stuff shortly. Um, but so far, we have 323 species detected um, at trees, which is huge. Uh, so it's about 52% of birds detected um, in Belize. So that includes all of the shorebirds, all of the seabirds, all of the savanna birds. Um, and so it's, it, we feel that it's significant that the Maya Mountains will harbor half of the, at least half um, of the birds found in Belize. And from what we can tell, at least at our tree site, is that it will be used extensively as nesting, feeding, roosting grounds, and off breeding. Uh, ground zone sites as well. So for eBird, um, with all the great bird watchers that have uh, have come to the station and interns and volunteers um, that have been using eBird, uh, we now have over 2,000 lists. Um, we are at an eBird hotspot, and it's with the help um, uh, of all these observations that we've, we are now at 323 species. Um, some years we don't get too many new birds. This year um, has been quite uh, pretty good. We have a few new birds to add to our thing, to our list. Um, oh, mm. So yeah, black-bellied whistling ducks, uh, tricolored herons, agami herons, and the boat bill herons all hanging out close to the streams. Um, so those are all, um, we're not sure why new birds this year, um, maybe different observation times, etc. Some of it is that we've been doing more night work because um, we're also offering bat workshops, etc. So, so some of these um, birds now have been sort of doing uh, nocturnal work. So for our modus antenna, Um, it operated for two years, and unfortunately, uh, in the Maya Mountains, we get a lot of lightning storms, so it got zapped last year. Um, and now in the last six months, we've got a, a new one going and are collecting data again for this winter. So we've collected the modus for those years, I think it was for uh, yeah, 2017, 2018. Um, it detected six different um, animals of three different species. And so those were wood thrush, Swainson's thrush, and barn swallow. Uh, Swainson's thrush and wood thrush were most of the detections, uh, but still very interesting to see that a barn swallow you know, coming, not sure where it came from, um, North America coming down off, off to the Maya Mountains. So for our banding efforts, um, Total amount of birds, well, extracted from nets, et cetera, is 15,000 birds. Um, so a lot of hard work, a lot of birds. We're very happy to see that number. Um, so there's 9,000 that were new bands, uh, 3,000 that were recapped. So we're getting some very high uh, recapture rates, both in residents and migrants, uh, which we're very happy about. Um, we can tell here, see here that the number of abandoned birds seems quite high. 
so that can be attributed to um, well, quite a bit of hummingbirds. So we don't ban hummingbirds, but they're still um, calculated and the birds captured. And also um, remember that I said at the beginning of the presentation that we only started banning resident birds in 2015. So there's, uh, there's some quite a few resident birds between 2012 and 2015 that were not, uh, that are part of this high number of abandoned birds. But since then, um, yeah, now it's just the, the hummingbirds. So um, total migrant species banded at the station is 70. Um, just showing again on how important the area uh, my amounts are for uh, migratory species, and we've banded over 132 species of resident birds. So we're gathering vital data on resident birds. Uh, I guess this year is going to be, um, we now have an intern that's going to help us with uh, publications, and so uh, we will be reviewing a lot of this data in the next few months. So next year I can give a, a different presentation with uh, more results. But for now, we know that it's allowing us to gain important, uh, well, we know that it is an important breeding site for resident birds. Um, that is a very important feeding site um, with our mannequin project as well, that it's an important licking site for white collar mannequin and red cat mannequins. I think at the moment we have at least five active mannequin licks um, happening at this minute. Uh, the, um, yeah, so it's allowing us to really know how uh, the uses of the Maya mountains of the region and how important they are to birds. Um, it's allowing us to establish breeding seasons in many species because we are finding those brood patches and uh, NCPs um, on birds. Um, shortly, we should start getting longevity records. Um, I know that for our mannequin projects, a lot of our mannequins now we know are all at least five years old, which is um, still within record. Um, but we're hoping that in a couple of years of keeping doing this work that shortly we should get longevity records. And that uh, we've established a site use in many resident species as well as, well, astral migrants, which I'll speak about in a minute. It's also uh, established as an important off breeding ground site. So, which I would say wintering site, but it, you know, don't like to use that much anymore, but there are many species of uh, neotropical migrants. Uh, these are the most common ones that we get in winter that actually spend most of the winter um, at the base or at the station. So the thrushes, um, yeah, red-eyed vireo, gray cat bird, anyways, and quite a few of the warblers will be at the station um, the whole season or the whole between um, between October and, and March, more or less. So for warblers, uh, we've banded over 30 species of warblers so far. And uh, there's a few warblers, Megilla Ray's warblers and orange crowned warbler. I think we're only the, I think Megilla Ray's is the second or the third observation um, in Belize. And orange crown, I think it was maybe the first. There was some anecdotal uh, observations of it, but the one with a picture. Um, we've also had Lawrence's warbler, which is a mix between um, second generation cross between blue wing and golden wing warblers. Um, and then golden wing warblers and cerulean warblers as well. We've had um, a few observations. It's also an important breeding site for astral migrants. Um, so we have evidence of yellow green vireo as well as uh, sulfur bellied flycatchers using, uh, using the Mayan mountains extensively um, during their breeding season. And as well, um, we've got quite a few IUCN listed birds, um, either through cannon traps, so the great curacao, and crested guan, those have been observed um, 
either through eBird accounts or um, through the camera traps. Yellow-headed Amazon will fly regularly overhead of the station. Um, all of sighted flycatcher will there will be uh, quite common as well. Um, well, golden wing, I think we had we had four uh, captures and cerulean warbler, I think only two. But these are all um, IUCN listed, so showing again the importance of um, this site and the MIMMs. Oh, sorry for the uh, block here. Okay, so about our, our training program results. Um, we know that we've been doing these programs for the last 10 years. So either internationally um, and locally. Uh, so we've trained over 32 international interns that have come for a minimum of two weeks. Um, most of them have come for a period of six weeks. Um, a lot of our internships uh, will finish with um, a banding workshop, so offered by the North American Banding Council, or NABC. Um, so we've run um, over nine of these workshops now. Um, oh, I forgot to fill out these areas. Um, so we've certified like so, well, there we go, I'm putting it in the spot. I never did get to fill these out. Um, I believe that it was, well, it's probably over about 40 participants that have received a certification, uh, well, no more like 60. And then those would include 10 Belizeans uh, from, or uh, from Central America or the Caribbean. So local band or training, um, um, we've trained um, a lot of locals either through our internships. Um, um, some have taken the NABC, as I've said before, so 10 of them at least, well, more than that have taken the workshops, but 10 of them uh, went through certification. Um, at this year, we did three local-based workshops. Um, this was all directed and founded by Avidas Ash, uh, which works for ERI and the University of Belize. Um, she's been doing some fantastic work um, in Belize, leading multiple MOZI um, stations at the same time, as well as ensuring um, training for Belizean banders and making sure that it will it will keep. Um, growing. Um, and then last year as well, we do a local base uh, a workshop and a training session for TIDE, one of the local NGOs, which were with all four uh, Belizean banders. And so with, with all of this, we are really feeling that um, we have 30 to 40 different uh, banders or extractors. Uh, that um, that are ready to, to continue, well, are, are working on multiple um, of the field stations or the banding stations in Belize, sorry. I just had a little mix up there. Um, and then with the BDIS, I think that I believe now we're at six, uh, six or seven Mosey stations, which I will, um, in Belize. So there's a lot of banding going around. Um, there's a lot of training and exchanges between uh, Belizean banders um, going between the different sites and getting to know each other and, uh, and how the different stations work. So we're really starting to get a feeling of uh, the creation of a, a bird banding um, culture in Belize now. It's getting uh, bigger, more, more Belizeans want to participate. It's, uh, and uh, a few of them are getting a trainer level, um, which we are really happy about. So we've done a lot of uh, local training and school activities. So we've received hundreds of kids come to look at our banding program and look at the birds that they have in Belize, et cetera, to get them um, excited about birds and bird conservation. Um, we've had over 200 uh, University of Belize students from various environmental courses, uh, classes, um, ornithology, ecology, um, et cetera, that have come to the station as well. 
Um, we've hosted to a lot of Belizean groups, even Belizean families, which have come down with their kids and where we explain uh, everything that we're doing. The idea is just to keep creating excitement about bird conservation and uh, bird banning in the country. Because it's such a small country, um, everybody talks. And so we found that it's uh, important to show uh, locals on um, on what we on what we do. Okay, maybe that one we've already talked about. Hey Matt, it's, it's uh, yeah. we're coming in on coming close to ten for the hour, and I definitely wanted to leave some time for questions um, that, okay. that people can put in the chat if they want. Yeah, yeah I have two slides. So go, go ahead, but if we could wrap up and help. Two slides. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So capacity and evolution of bird banding lab in Belize, which I talked about. There's multiple NGOs uh, in Belize now invested uh, into the MOSI program and to um, doing continuing bird banding and bird monitoring. And uh, yeah, where do we go from here? So for this year, it's um, really starting to apply for more grants and stuff to keep our long-term monitoring projects going, getting more graduate projects and also getting uh, publications out in the next um, few months. So that's it. These are all of our partners that we thank and uh, thank you for listening to this talk. Thank you so much, Matt. That was, that was fantastic. You guys are doing just great work in a really beautiful and incredibly important area for both migrants and residents. It's really, uh, it's really heartening. So thank you so much for everything you're doing. Um, anybody uh, can put a, um, a question for Matt in the chat. Um, there was one question early on from uh, Rowan McNabb, and he wanted to know um, if you could estimate your costs for the, for the MODIS network. I know MODIS is just, um, gosh, it's just really uh, taken off, um, and we're really excited uh, in getting more MODIS towers in Central America um, for, for, for migrant birds. Um, it offers such a great opportunity, you know, the isthmus being such a being such a narrow focal point and being such an important migratory stopover area. Um, I've already been in, in discussions with several MOSI stations about sort of uh, getting MODIS towers established at MOSI stations where there's already you know, technical staff that are capable of, of um, you know, handling it and troubleshooting it technically. But what would you estimate your, your costs are for getting the towers and putting them up and maintaining them? Um. That's a hard one. I'd have to think about that and, and uh, send it over. But the the antennas could be done differently. Um, we did our, ours um, at the station with our workers and welders. And so the cost was actually really not too bad. So it depends where you are and can you build your own um, antenna or do you need to, uh, your own tower or do you need to, to buy an already set one? Uh, but in terms of the, the gear itself, um, they're all, they're all quite low, but I can send the uh, information and the contact information for for uh, the modus work too. That work? That would be great. Thanks. If anybody else has any questions, you can put them in the chat, or you could just uh, go ahead and go ahead and speak up. Uh, maybe I saw Leslie put up her hand. Yeah, go, go ahead, Leslie, if you have a question. I can't see everybody. Yeah. Hello? I'm no, here, she Leslie, said she, doesn't, she didn't have a question. Greg? No, okay. Sorry, I don't have a question. I was just uh, trying to clap and I raised my hand. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, maybe cool. I will ask a question. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Um, so I've, yeah. I'm just interested in the bands that you're using on your resident uh, species, and if you're connected to like maybe other countries or other networks uh, with similar bands. So can you tell us a little bit the, about the bands on resident species? I'm assuming they're not the North American bands. No, they're not. Uh, yeah, so there's a lot of talk for what we started doing. Uh, we created our own band with Horzana that we ordered in 2015. And so we're still using those those Porzana bands. So I think it says trees on it. It has a phone number and then and then a letter and uh, four or five numbers. Um, 
in Belize now, since then, the other stations, the other Mozi stations with Abida Zash and uh, from the University of Belize have now made their own national band um, bands, which they are hoping that all of the stations in Belize uh, will start using. So the idea for now is that I'll be switching um, my Prozana bands to, to the Belize bands as, um, as mine um, get used up. But I know that um, there's been talk about bands through Birds Caribbean as well uh, that might be uh, made at some point. So I was also interested in knowing about that one. So that's our band situation right now. Go ahead, so Greg. Is, yeah, the, uh, this is Greg Butcher. Um, thanks for the presentation, enjoyed it a lot. And I was interested in talking about the importance of the Maya Mountains for North American breeders. And I know you had a slide with a list of the most important or the most common uh, migrants on the site. And I was wondering if we could go to that slide and talk about the importance of your area for those species. Uh, for as wintering ground or? That... Yeah. Uh, which one? This one? Yeah. So um, uh, is this an order of importance or? No, not in order of importance, uh, but mostly birds that we catch throughout the season. So throughout the wintering time, so we'll, we can catch four or five times um, throughout, throughout a, um, a wintering period. So which of those would you say are the most common in your area? Um, I, I, well, all of these birds you'll see regular on a regular loop in the wintering time in all their different habitats, you will, um, all of them will be present. I think we have a pretty high presence of wood thrush. I'd say Kentucky warbler is really high. Um, and, and prothon, I think for the size of the populations, we seem to be getting quite a few as well. The others I think are, are just there regularly, but I'm not sure about um, if it means, represents anything in terms of their populations. Yeah, that's, uh, that's great because I just think of the, the Mayan forest as so important for wood thrush and Kentucky warbler. And so to see your data corroborate that, I think is really interesting. Good. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and like the wood thrush, like on the modus antenna um, is our most common. Um, well, it might have been mostly one individual that went 36 times, but it's, still <laughs> strong, it's showing strong fidelity. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's a question from Guy uh, Folks who is asking um, if you have any interesting findings on survival. Do you, do you guys get um, uh, some of the North American um, non-breeders uh, non showing up uh, year after year? Is there any site fidelity from which you can make any inferences about survival? Um, the results will be coming out shortly, that's what I should be saying. Um, and it docs, uh, just through observation, um, we've had a hooded warbler, northern water thrush, and American red start that I know that I've seen for at least three, four years in a row. It was the, well, I can't say for sure it was the same individual, but it was same branch, uh, same age and sex as prior years. So I'd say for those species, um, I would say that it's quite high, but it's really just a thought for now. It hasn't been investigated properly. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And I guess from the maps end, we can say that um, we haven't done a specific investigation of um, any species that are specifically, uh, we know are overwintering or migrating through Belize for a, a maps uh, survival, but um, that's certainly possible to do. Right. Any other any other questions? Well, it's coming up on the top of the hour, so um, we can hang out a little bit more if anybody wants to ask a question. But um, anybody else that wants to get on with the other things they have to do, please feel free. Uh, thank you so much for your attendance. Um, and as a lot of, you may know, that these, this is going to be a monthly webinar series. Uh, um, a lot of a lot of the initial talks are with folks that are banding in Central and South America, which is great. 
Um, but if anybody has an idea for a presentation, um, it's sponsored by the Western Bird Banding Association and IBP. Um, largely bird, bird banding is our, is our thing and, and, the, and the study of um, vital rates. So if you have an idea for a presentation, please let me know and we'd love to schedule you. Um, next month is gonna be Alan Monroy, who's a longtime uh, bird bender in Mexico. Um, I don't have the title of his talk yet, but uh, stay tuned and I'll, I'll be sure to let everybody know. But uh, perhaps Matt, you can, maybe you can hang out for a couple minutes uh, in case there's any lingering questions. And yeah, just to reiterate that the talk will be uh, available um, on our website, uh, Institute for Bird Populations, then go to publication and there's a drop down that says for video presentations. So thank you so much, everybody.